There has never been a bigger and more exciting season for sports betting. Winning season at MyBookie is all about doubling your deposit, cashing in on free bets, super contests, survivor streaks, and more. Every cent with a thousand bucks will be met with a match up to $1,000. So you can get your bets in for the game between the Texans and the Chiefs on Thursday night. All you have to do is use your promo code HOLLY to claim your extra cash. That's code HOLLY at mybookie.com for dollar to dollar deposit match. Winning season is here and it's only with my bookie. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Today, I am very excited to have sex worker, number one companion at the Bunny Ranch, advocate, educator, YouTuber. I feel like this girl has so many titles, I can't even name them all. So maybe we'll just call her Alice Little. Oh, hi. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. You're so welcome. So, so like I said, I was do. I mean, obviously, I've known about you for a while. You're probably the most famous, at least in America, definitely in Nevada, um, companion, right? What's like here? Before I go any further, because I know a lot of people terminology confuses them. What is a term that you would prefer to be used to describe what you do? So I am very comfortable with the phrase companion, especially now in the COVID-19 era where I'm not necessarily working at the Bunny Ranch. In the past, I've referred to myself as a legal luxury companion to kind of differentiate the fact that it's happening out of a Nevada brothel versus independent work. Mm -hmm. Okay. So like a companion would be a good way to describe you because I've had other women in your line of work on before and like some preferred escorts. Um, I, I know that I had Amy Taylor on. I don't know if you know who she is. Oh, she's wonderful. Um, yeah, she's great. But she had some really interesting um, opinions about terminology. Mm. So, uh, so so escorting was kind of like for her, um, her most preferred term. But anyways, my point is, is that, you know, I was, I was looking you up and, and I was looking at your website alicelittle.com. And I was so amazed by how you've diversified what you do. You offer so many different things, not just companionship, and I'm sure you've had to diversify in the age of COVID-19 because I would imagine you're probably, I don't know if you're working now or if you're working less than you. I mean, if under any circumstances, I'm sure you're working under different conditions, but you also offer like counseling, intimacy, coaching, education, um, so many different things. Yes. I wanted to put myself out there in a number of different ways that were very specific. I feel like the idea of companionship is very, very broad. What is a companion? What do they do? What, what kind of services are they providing? And so I tried to kind of distill it down and speak a little bit more to the individual and what their needs are. Because you figure someone that's a 21-year-old virgin is going to have very, very different intimate needs than, say, someone who's 60 years old and is grieving the loss of their wife and is now a widow. Mm-hmm. And then you also offer um, intimacy coaching like for couples as well, right? Yes. I love working with couples, couples, throuples, polycules, any combination thereof, pick a shape. Do you have a favorite of all of these different avenues that you do? Do you have a favorite niche? Ooh, if I had to say an absolute favorite niche of mine is probably working with couples that have been together for five or more years that are kind of past that honeymoon phase. And now they're trying to figure out their long-term intimacy strategy. And I think that's just so interesting. And I love being able to help facilitate that. So what is the issue that these couples come to you with generally? Like, is, has their sex life petered off? Are they kind of bored? Are they looking for new ways to invigorate that, that intimacy, intimacy between them? And they figure that bringing in a, a third party would help? 
Most commonly, I'm presented with a scenario in which guests have become very accustomed to a sex routine. This is what their intimate lives look like and never shall it leave this little bubble. But after five or so, ten years of that same routine, people want to break outside of the mold. But as we all know, it's very very, very difficult to kind of liberate yourself from a system that you've kind of become stuck in and break those habits. And so oftentimes I'll come in and present them with new interesting ways that they can interact and kind of examine, hey, what sorts of directions do you want to explore? What things are you interested in? And then I help them kind of navigate those waters. So do you do this sometimes where you are a participant in the sexual activity and then sometimes where maybe you're not and you're just like coaching them? Do you have both scenarios? Yes, I absolutely have both scenarios. For example, sometimes it'll be kind of like teach and tell where like I'll walk somebody through the anatomy and how something should look and this is how your two bodies are going to come together. Now it's your turn. Go ahead, give it a try, and then I'll be on hand to kind of offer pointers. Whereas other times, I'm actually a very active participant in it where we're doing mutual foreplay and I'm showing them, hey, this is how you can kind of take the act of simply removing clothing and turn this into like kind of a flirty floor play activity and make something more of it than just take your clothing off, put it on the floor. That's that's an opportunity there. Mm. Now, you also seem to have a lot of experience with BDSM and you consider yourself a switch. I love how excited you get about that. Uh, So, and you consider yourself a switch, a top, you can play the top and the bottom. Do you have an actual like personal preference for either one? I am as true of a switch as one can possibly be. I was involved in BDSM and kink education even before working at the Bunny Ranch. I was traveling around the country, teaching at different events, and I just absolutely loved it. I think that there's so much to be learned from both sides of the spectrum, top and bottom. And then there's also a very interesting dynamic in switching back and forth within the same scenario, sort of like within primal play where you're struggling for that control. I think that there's just so many different experiences that I don't want to limit myself to just being, I am a top or I am a bottom. No, I, I think it's fun to experience the whole gambit of it. And so you uh, sometimes take people through their very first BDSM experience, correct? I would assume that most of the time in those scenarios, you're playing the top and that person is playing the submissive, or do you ever like teach someone how to be a top? It definitely goes both ways. So there tends to be three different types of scenarios that happen in the kink sphere. The first, of course, is the one you described as far as me being the top and running somebody through a whole bunch of different sensations and activities so they can learn a little bit more about what they enjoy or may not enjoy as much. I also am able to kind of teach from the bottom where I'm able to give pointers to somebody while also being on the receiving end of things, such as, hey, the falls of the flogger aren't quite close enough to my back. Go ahead and take a a little half step forward. All right, there you go. Now you're in the right side of contact. And then the third way is involving couples, folks that want to invite BDSM into their lives and may not necessarily know how. And so in those scenarios, I'm teaching both roles at the same time and walking a couple through that first experience. That must be really fun to kind of open up people's eyes to a whole new sexual experience in a shame-free atmosphere. I think that's something that a lot of people don't get to experience. I I agree. I agree with that. It's a rare opportunity to essentially lay your soul naked, not just your body naked, but be completely vulnerable about your interests, your passions, your fantasies, your fetishes, and know that you're in a place that isn't going to judge you or stigmatize you or make assumptions about who you are based off of the things that you might be into. What is some of the most common feedback that you get from customers? Well, first, people always say, oh, my God, you are really little because <laughs> I'm, I'm all of four foot eight, which is very, very hard for people to conceptualize. I mean, I am very, very petite. So that's usually the first remark is, I know you said you were little, but like, wow, really, like really little, though. And then the second remark I tend to get is, 
wow, you're really like educated and articulate in this. Did you study? Did you take degrees? And probably the third most common is I did not think that this is what sex work would be. I had no idea that this is what I was in store for. This is the idea I had. And here's reality over here in a different bubble. What do you think, speaking of um, people's misconceptions about sex work, particularly companionship, um, I've had a few girls on who, you know, work in the sex service industry. Um, Charlotte Sartre was one that came on and I think she was like my first guest to kind of speak openly about working in a brothel. She, she works at the alien cat house. Is that mm-hmm. right? Um, and let me tell you something, my YouTube views on those clips are like through the roof. And I know that you have a YouTube channel as well. And you're also, yours is also very successful. So people are fascinated by this idea of, of brothels and legal sex work and a companionship. So what is, I mean, you must come across people who, you know, obviously have a very specific idea of what you must be like, what your life is like, what your work is like. And then, you know, they experience working with you and, or your services, I should say, and it's completely different than what they thought. So what are like some of the biggest myths that you would really like to dispel about what you do? Well, first has got to be the environment itself. When most people hear the word brothel or bordello, their mind takes them to some smoky, dimly lit bar that's hazy in the middle of a desert, out nowhere, surrounded by a whole bunch of skimpy clad women in 10 inch tall heels. And that is just not the reality of it. The brothels are set up more like living rooms where there's like a front foyer and you walk in and there's couches and it's actually quite comfortable. Sure, there is a bar and you certainly can get something to drink, but you're not probably not going to sit at the bar and have your drink. You're probably going to go kick back on a couch, meet some of the ladies, have some interesting conversations. So it's important to remember, too, that we are not all located in the middle of the Nevada desert. The Bunny Ranch, which is the location I currently, well, previously worked at, currently work at. It's hard to say with COVID because we don't necessarily know which locations will reopen on the other side of this all. It is certainly far from the middle of nowhere. We're 45 minutes to the Reno airport. We are very much so a part of civilization. (laughs) So walk me through what it's like for a first timer coming to the Bunny Ranch and they want to hire a girl. How, How does that work? So there's a few different ways that somebody can go about connecting with the lady. First, is simply walking into the location without an appointment. You aren't necessarily sure who it is you want to connect with, but you just kind of want to go and see for yourself. So when you walk in without an appointment, the first thing that's going to happen is they're going to check your ID, verify you don't have any like bombs or anything in your bag. They'll ask you to open up your bag, make sure there's nothing problematic in there, which usually there's not. And then they're going to hit the bell to allow the ladies knowledge that we now have a guest in the parlor. The ladies are then going to come up and kind of stand in a line in front of you and introduce themselves one by one by name. Then the host, who's the person who has now also checked your ID, is going to encourage you to walk up to the lady, take her by the hand, and then she will take you on a tour of the facilities. After that tour, you'll then end up back in that lady's suite Depending on the brothel, some brothels have separate negotiation rooms. Others do it in the ladies' room. In my location, we just go right back to our personal suite. And then we have that conversation about what sorts of things might you be interested in, what kind of connection you're looking for, and kind of go from there. The second way that happens is if someone does want to set up an appointment, they know they're traveling out, it's going to be a big experience and and an occasion for them. And so they really want to make sure that they're connecting with the right person. So you might go onto the website and scroll through some of the different photos, read some of the profiles, watch a few videos before choosing which email or which lady you want to email. Then you'll be able to email back and forth, get to know her a little bit and share some information about what it is you're interested in. Then 
you and the lady are going to agree upon a day and a time that you're going to meet. And then you'll phone the ranch to place a deposit, usually 10% to just kind of have like a placeholder reservation, which then goes towards the actual booking date. And then you come into the ranch and instead of a lineup, you'll ring the button two times instead of just the one time to let the front person know, hey, I'm here to see someone specific. Please don't send the cavalcade of sex workers and have them all lined up in front of me. I know who I'm here to see. Right. So then the negotiation about what kind of sex acts they want to do and the price is then done on the phone before they come in? Nope. All pricing conversations by Nevada law have to take place on the brothel property. About as close as we are legally able to share over email is say something along the lines of, oh, that's in the ballpark range. If somebody says, oh, I've got this kind of budget or this price in mind, I can tell somebody like, hey, you're in the right track or, okay, so we'll have to do some adjusting when we meet in person or, okay, that's like a a four-figure experience versus something that's more prolonged, which may be like a five-figure experience experience. But unfortunately, the law doesn't really allow us to go much beyond that. Yeah, I remember that was Charlotte was saying that, which I found to be kind of bizarre. So then it's like, you don't know exactly what you're in for. And like, you put a deposit down, but you don't know, like, what exactly you're going to end up paying in the long run. Um, I guess you guys probably have some kind of minimum deposit, at the very least. Um, just to set up the appointment and then the negotiations can go from there. But you have to do the negotiations yourself, right? It can't be oh, a third absolutely. party. No. Nope. Do you, do you, okay. So, cause just, cause personally, I'm really, I'm terrible at talking about money. I'm really bad and I don't have an agent and I'm my own person and I, you know, give people my rates, but like, it's it's an issue that I have. So do you find that having to negotiate with people for pricing, has that helped you at all with maybe like, I don't know, like recognizing your self-worth, talking about money? Like, do you find that uncomfortable or is that just something that you're totally used to by now? It's a factor in the process in order from us to get from point A to point B, there's got to be that middle ground where we do have that very real conversation about dollars and cents And the way I like to think of it is not so much a negotiation because that feels very combative. I like to think Mm. of it more as a conversation because I'm not trying to make you go outside of your comfort zone. You know exactly where you are financially, what you are comfortable doing, and I know what I have my rates kind of set at. So we're, we're not haggling back and forth. Instead, we're collaborating and figuring out, okay, well, what do we want an experience to look like? What are the most important things for you? What things do you really want to focus on? Where do you want to spend the most time? What kinds of things maybe aren't as important to you, but if we have time for, let's go ahead and do those as well. So this way, by the time we're leaving my suite and heading to the front desk to go ahead and book the experience, both of us are feeling really happy with the experience that we've already had. You 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 sound almost. Uh, it sounds almost more like you're like a financial advisor. <laughs> I don't know. I I guess for me, I don't focus on the money. That's not yeah. my motivation for being in this industry. If I was worried about money, I probably would have gone into the financial sector. I. Yeah focus more on the value that I'm able to bring to people's lives, what kind of needs they have that I'm possibly able to fulfill, questions that I could answer, information that I can share. That to me is like the real value in what I do is being able to share those sorts of things with people. And oftentimes I find that that value alone makes people understand when I say this experience is going to be X dollars and cents. And they're like, oh, Mm -hmm okay, well, that makes sense. All right. Thank Mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So they paid and you're, you're ready to move forward. What are the next steps? You take them back to your room. Do you have to check them for any unsightly issues around the genitals, anything that might be a concern? Mm -hmm. So by law, Legal sex workers in Nevada are required to be tested every seven days for STDs and STIs. We are literally the most tested population on the planet. And as such, we do take safety very, very seriously. Condoms, dental dams, protection is required for any and all sex acts. And before the experience even gets booked, after 
that conversation has happened. But before we leave my suite and go to the window, we first do something called a DC, which is our very polite way of saying, why, yes, we are going to have you drop trouser and we are going to take this swipe and make sure that everything looks happy and healthy down below. I've uh, talked to some girls who say that sometimes they like to give their customer a sensual bath first, and that kind of helps them check them in like a non-confrontational way. And then also too, just ensures that they're clean and, mm-hmm. you know, like, cause it could have been a long drive through the desert, you know, with no air conditioning, you know, who knows what kind of condition they may be in when they show up. Do you do anything like that? Um, so sometimes, usually in the Nevada brothel setting, typically you want to go ahead and do that DC before any sort of financials exchange hands. This gotcha. way, everything we've discussed, we're making sure, yes, we can actually do those things rather than arriving at the other side and going, oh, actually, we can't do anything. And we're just going to have to now reinvent our experience on the fly. I, I feel like that would be almost more confrontational to somebody than just that, hey, okay, so to tell you a little bit about my safety, here's the things I've done for safety, and now this is the next part of that safety, which is what keeps us both safe. So I kind of like to take almost an educational stance on it in a way where I almost like to normalize it, where it's it's not a big deal, like, hey... This should be a part of the conversation anytime you have sex. Hey, when's the last time you had STD or STI paperwork? Mine was done this past Wednesday as a legal sex worker. It's done every seven days. Another thing that we do here for protection is this little check. And then I explain what's going to happen before actually going ahead and doing so. Yeah, that's a... Because I, you know, in shooting porn, I've definitely come across issues where, and you know, we, we do testing every two weeks. So you guys are actually Mm -hmm. more tested than, than our performers are, but there are some people that will show up to set sometimes. And this doesn't happen often. The pros know, like if they have an issue, if they have an open sore, um, if they have a cut or whatever, they have an outbreak, like they know to cancel, but sometimes people show up and like, I don't know if they think like, I'm not we're not going to notice. I had one girl show up with genital warts and she actually didn't know what they were. Oh, and I, I know, I know. And it was really sad. I had to take a picture of a, and then pull her into the other room and show her the photo and go, do you know what these are? And she was like, Oh, I just thought it was razor burn. I said, no, those are, those are genital warts. And she was like, Oh, well, my boyfriend had something like that, but he told me like it was like it was just a razor burn. So I thought that's what I got. So I was like, oh my God, he gave it to you. And then he like lied to you about it. <sighs> so then I had to send her home and it was like, and I didn't want to tell the other girl why mm. because I didn't want to embarrass her. Yeah. So I was like, oh, she's not feeling well. So, but by then, you know, we'd shot the pretty girl. She'd gone through hair and makeup. It was like, we were already at that stage where like, ah. You got to figure this out. Shoot. Yeah. So you guys have a better system actually kind of than we do. I think we just like assume like performers, you know, know better because obviously like everybody's working together and our industry has been tested, but, but that doesn't always necessarily mean, you know, it's going to catch certain things. So Mm -hmm. it's true. And it also speaks to the absolute absolute disgusting lack of sex education that we have in this country Mm -hmm. that people are so ill-informed as to what is happening to their own bodies and unfortunately we have now shamed people about their bodies and shamed them so deeply about sex that they don't want to talk to their primary care physician about something they would rather go oh no 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 i see nothing and yeah it's it's really unfortunate. I mean, I, I can only speak for myself, but there's definitely been a few circumstances where I've had to then take a moment to educate a guest as to their own body and explain, hey, that's vitiligo. That's a totally normal skin condition. And I am so sorry that nobody has ever taken the time to explain. It doesn't just affect your fingertips. It can affect your whole body. There's nothing wrong with you. You're not broken. You're not diseased. It's just a basic skin condition. It's a okay. Yeah. Isn't it interesting how, you know, you as a sex worker are taking on this like educational role that should have been fulfilled, I don't know, maybe in school. Um, That'd be real least, nice. That'd be so nice. Some way. 
<laughs> picking up the slack of like our shitty education system. <laughs> yeah. At, at the same time, I, I was very, very privileged. I was very, very privileged to have quality sex education through the majority of school. Now, did it necessarily touch on women's pleasure? Uh, not quite. Did it talk about consent in a very thorough way? Not necessarily, but I, I pretty much got the bulk of the information. But many of my guests come to me and share their experiences with sex ed, and they've gotten nothing. They've gotten the stork story. I, oh God, I found a statistic that just like, ooh, it like gives me a rash that only 13 of the 50 states are required to have scientifically accurate sex ed. 13. Oh, that's absolutely. That's absolutely true. And I actually, so I had a, a, I I had a guest on last week, uh, dirty Lola, who's a sex educator and she's so wonderful. Yeah. And we talked about that and we talked about, um, so I had dirty Lola on last week and we talked about that and we talked about sex education and we went like deep. We talked about what you mentioned earlier about even with proper sex education, we never talk about pleasure, especially not female pleasure. Um, so there's still like this sense of shame around, um, pleasure and in regards to sexuality, it's just more about, you know, how the body works and how to make babies and how to not make babies and that kind of thing. But even when there was, I don't know, like sex education week or sex education classes, she was saying how she remembers. And I remember this as well, having to go home with a release for my parents to sign, yes. to say, like I consent to have my child learn about sex education and how, you know, a lot of kids' parents weren't comfortable with that. And then they would pull them out of those classes. So even places that, that have sex education, not everybody gets that education because if it's something that the parents don't want them to learn about, then they're not going to. Mm-hmm. So. That's such a, it's such a problem. I, I've been very lucky to work with a number of virgins that have come to me for their first experience. And I always try to weave as much education like through the whole experience. So it's like, haha, you don't know that you're learning how to put a condom on, but really you just learned how to put a condom on and make sure that it's on the correct way. You're welcome. A little bonus from me to all your future girlfriends. Enjoy. So tell me a little bit about uh, your virgin clients? Cause that's fascinating to me. How, how does that go for the m- most part? And do you have any like specific stories that really stick out in your head? Mm, so I see virgins of all ages, everyone from 18 on up. I want to say I've had somebody come in that was like 62 years old and just never had an opportunity in his life to connect in that way and finally decided that he was emotionally ready for it. So I, I want to remove the myth that like virgins have to be a certain age. Like there is no right time. It's whenever you are ready. There's no stigma, no shame whenever you are ready. Um, Within that, though, I tend to get a lot of folks that want the right way to do things because through the media, through interactions with their friends, they've been presented with numerous horror stories and they really want to avoid those things, kind of the pitfalls and traps when it comes to dating and sex and having those experiences. And then, of course, there's the emotional vulnerability of, hey, I've never had sex before and I don't know if I'm doing this the right way. I want to go to someone that isn't going to judge me for my lack of experience and is instead going to help and guide me through a quality experience. As far as stuff that sticks out in my head, I I can think of one. I do want to clarify, I always get consent from my guests before even anonymously sharing their experiences or sharing anything about them. I always make sure, do I have permission to share your experience anonymously? And I do have consent to talk about this one. It was a guest who was on the autism spectrum who had a lot of sensory processing issues. In particular, he struggled a lot with soft touch. Most of us find like this kind of motion where you're gently running your fingers across your arm or somebody is stroking your hair to be very pleasurable. And for him, sensory wise, it was very, very, very overwhelming. He was only very comfortable with deep, intense, like grabbing types of pressure. And so our first experience was very, very different from that of, say, another guest's, where there was a good 30 minutes, hour or so, that was just spent processing different sensations. So this way, we would do something. 
And then we would take some time so this way he could process through that. And then we would try something else. And then we would talk about it. How did that feel? What did you like? What did you not like? This way, as he goes forward into new relationships, he's able to articulate, these are the things I enjoy. These are the things I don't enjoy. And then here are the things I'm able to compromise on where they're not my favorite. But if you enjoy it, we can make that happen. Wow. That's that's an incredible... First of all, you must have so much patience, um, which I find very admirable. I don't have as much patience. And uh, you seem like somebody who's really loving and caring. And I can't imagine that an experience with you would be anything but wonderful. And and I, I can totally understand you know, that, that situation with the male virgin, there's so much pressure on men to be these kind of sexual conquerors Mm -hmm. and to be, um, you know, well-versed in the sexual landscape, even if they've never done it before. And I would imagine, because I definitely get these letters from some guys as well and comments from virgins who are older. And it's like the older that you are and you remain a virgin, the more shameful, you feel about it. And then the more difficult it is to find a woman who would understand your position and who would, who would teach you and who would educate you and who would take you through a positive experience. And I think that, that, that you providing that service to people is a wonderful example of how sex work and companionship is a really um, gentle and just incredibly kind service that you're giving people. I know a lot of people think about, you know, what you do is as something being dirty and how can you sell your body for money? I mean, you know, obviously in working in the adult industry, I see these comments all the time and I know that you're on you. I know you're on YouTube. So, and those were, those are the worst Uh. people on YouTube are the worst. So you see these comments all the time too. So I know you know what I'm talking about. But when you look at it in that way that you're really providing this intimate experience for somebody who's, who's never had the opportunity to be with a woman and, and who may never have that opportunity outside of, you know, a, a transaction like with yours, it's just like a really kind of beautiful thing if you think about it. I I love it. It's very important. And I always like to recognize the fact that sex work is nothing new. This has been with us since the dawn of time. Like if we go back to the very first piece of legal written document that we have evidence of, Hammurabi's Code literally talks about sex workers in Hammurabi's Code. We've been here for a minute. So clearly this is a service that we have needed throughout history. What that looks Mm. like, of course, has changed and evolved and adapted from society to society. But the fundamental act of sex work, this providing and taking care of people's intimate needs. It's real. It's legitimate. It's considered the world's oldest profession. Yeah. I mean, if you, (laughs) if, if, if you dear listener want to go back and listen to one of my favorite episodes with Dr. Yanaga, uh, where we talk about sex in the medieval times, she talks about brothels and she talks about how the, they considered it to be like a necessary, a necessary occupation mm-hmm. to, and so like le- sex work was actually legal back in the middle, middle ages. Hey, you might want to listen to this episode. Cause I'm like over here going, I need to listen to that episode. It's, I it's love really sex good. work history. Yeah. It's really good. I was, I was really excited about that one. So dear listener, if you go back and listen to my episode with uh, Dr. Yanaga about um, sex work and sex, sex in the medieval times in general, brothels were legal and um, sex work was legal and they considered it like a necessary occupation to help, I don't know if control or satiate like the male population. So um, it was, it was a legal, a legal occupation back in the middle ages. And it was one of the few where like women could actually run a business and own a business um, in the brothel sphere, like as a, as a brothel owner, but like a woman could never do like run a business anywhere else. So it was almost Mm -hmm. like uh, the only place that like women could have like a career quote unquote. So it's interesting. And you're absolutely right. I mean, sex work has been around 
for a long time and it will continue to be around. And, um, that's never going to change. It just depends on, you know, how we want to treat it and do we want to drive it underground and do we want to make it dangerous and do we want to make it seedy? So this brings up, um, a great question about sex work legally. And, um, I want to have you kind of explain to people the difference between decriminalization and legalization. But before we go there, we're going to take a quick commercial break. So hang on guys. We'll be right back. Say it with me now, guys, sports are back and it is winning season. What is winning season, do you ask? It's been the greatest sports season with three of the four biggest sports in playoff battles and NFL season kicks off this week. There has never been a bigger and more exciting season for sports betting. Winning season at my bookie is all about doubling your deposit cashing in on free bets, super contests, survivor streaks, and more. You can choose from thousands of bets on your favorite sports like NBA, NHL, and NFL with lines and props on your favorite teams and players. No sports book in the industry does prop bets like my bookie, which is why they're always so ahead of the competition when football season rolls around. Every cent with a thousand bucks will be met with a match up to $1,000. So you can get your bets in for the game between the Texans and the Chiefs on Thursday night. All you have to do is use your promo code HOLLY to claim your extra cash. That's code HOLLY at mybookie.com for dollar to dollar deposit match. Winning season is here and it's only with my bookie. If you're here, it's probably because you're a fan of my podcast, Holly Randall Unfiltered. Well, that's great because I'm a fan of my podcast too. Now, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a crowdfunding platform that allows people to make contributions on a monthly basis. Because this podcast costs money to make, maybe even more so than others. I'm obsessed with quality. So since the beginning, I have always recorded in a studio, had a professional sound engineer, and recorded professional video. All of these things cost money, as you can imagine. And I also made a pretty scary decision this year to cut down on my directing gigs so that I could focus more on this podcast, which is why I need your help now more than ever. But don't worry, I'm not asking you to give me something for nothing. In exchange for your contributions, I offer so many perks. For example, access to the live streams of all of my interviews, a bonus podcast that I do called My LA Porn Life, Q and A's where the stars answer your specific questions, behind the scenes interviews, merchandise such as mugs, shirts, and stickers, access to my private Snapchat, and so much more. You can join for as little as $5 a month and help me change the way the world sees the adult industry and sex work. So take a look around and see everything that I have to offer. I really hope that you'll join and be a part of our little community. Okay, we're back. So Alice, can you explain to those who may not know what the difference is between decriminalizing sex work and legalizing sex work and which you favor and why? So there's a few different things when it comes to decriminalization versus legalization. Right now in America, we have legalization that is limited to Nevada brothels only. That's one of the 50 states, and it's limited to somewhere between 20 and 22 locations at any given time that have these brothel licenses that allow them to work. Legalization applies a framework for how somebody can go into this industry and then also be able to participate in the financial structure. So I'm able to set up a bank account, make deposits. My taxes are all able to be done fully legally and above board. I don't have to worry about getting arrested for doing what I do. Everything is being done in that facet. However, it is also being done with a certain level of control. For example, in the legal sphere, I could never work independently legally. I am required by law to work out of a brothel. And to work at a brothel, I have to give up 50% of my income just to be able to work there. That's a standard contract that's agreed upon. Whereas in decriminalization, we have an environment that simply says we are not charging 
people for selling sex. It's not, it's not a crime. It's just something that exists in our society. However, decriminalization doesn't necessarily give a framework as far as who, what, where, when testing. It doesn't have any sort of controls or limitations as to what it should look like. It's more of a free form open. We are no longer pursuing it. We are going the, to allow this industry to self monitor, self regulate and kind of go from there. As far as what I'm in favor of, I would kind of like to see a hybridized model that more closely reflects what we see in New Zealand, which is going to be decriminalization as well as legalization that allows for not only brothel work, but true independent work. The reason why we need both is for a few different reasons. We have to have decriminalization for the most marginalized people that are at risk. And not just women, I'm talking about men, I'm talking about trans sex workers, I'm talking about non-binary sex workers, I'm talking about people that are immigrants to this country, migrant workers, and they're doing this at a survival-based level. They absolutely deserve protection. If somebody violates their consent, they need to be able to pick up the phone, call 911, and report that they have been raped and actually receive support from the police rather than being taken away in handcuffs like they are currently, which is grossly mm -hmm. problematic. Gro mm -hmm. mm. Lots of bad feelings about that. The legalized aspect of things, I think, needs to exist to some degree. It, it needs to be limited. There shouldn't be a dramatic amount of interference as far as what and where and how. But I certainly think that testing is important. I think that that keeps everyone, including the workers, safe. So it's in everyone's best interests. I think that rather than having a license like I currently have to, which is obtained through the sheriff's office and involves a very complicated process that involves an FBI fingerprint check, which is fun, and legal documentation of my name, address, social security number, emergency contacts, places of employment, everything. Rather than having to go through that process, it should be just as simple as, are you of age? Do you have testing? Fantastic. Here you go go do your job and you are able to participate in the financial sector, have a bank account, invest, etc. So I, I can't really choose between the two because I think on their own, they're both imperfect. They both have flaws. And the closest thing to an ideal model is going to be like they have in New Zealand, which is brothels for people who want brothels. We've got independent work for people who want to work independently. It's not just limited to women. It's open to men. It's open to trans. It's open to non-binary. And then they, of course, have the decriminalized aspect there as well. Mm. I'm going to slide in one of my Patreon questions here. I don't know if you may have kind of already answered this, but I just, I do want to, to ask you this because he did send it to me. Uh, Greg Rogers says, if decriminalization occurred tomorrow in the world, would you change the type of sex work you do to include being a long-term travel companion? Did you work in Ireland under the Nordic model or did you leave before that began? I, I moved stateside when I was five. So no, I did not get to work under the Nordic <laughs> model. And to explain to those who aren't familiar, the Nordic model is a type of decriminalization, but it's only partial decriminalization where the sex workers themselves are not being arrested. However, the purchasers, the guests, the quote unquote Johns absolutely could be arrested under a Nordic model, which is very problematic. Uh, the World Health Organization does not support the Nordic model that is certainly not ideal and does that is not what we mean when we say decriminalization some people will say um true decriminalization to kind of differentiate between the two as far mm. as if we did get decriminalization absolutely i would hit the ground running post-covid i love to travel i love 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 to travel and i think it would be really interesting to be able to travel about meet people in different locations it opens up a whole world of different experiences that i could share with somebody oh it would be so nice that'd be so nice like i only live in nevada because this is where the brothels are like right. that's it i moved here for that that's the only reason yeah yeah. Um, we spoke a little bit before we started the podcast about um, unionizing sex workers and how that was kind of a new, interesting movement. Can you tell us your thoughts about that? 
Yes. Historically speaking, in the world of sex work and unionizing or any sort of organization, it had previously been very segmented where you had strippers that are campaigning for strippers' rights. You have porn stars that are focused on porn stars' rights. You have sex workers, in-person service folks that are interested in in-person service rights. You have all your dungeon folk, all your pro-doms that are focused on those rights. And nobody really was necessarily like cross advocating for each other. Everyone was kind of sticking in their own lane. Now we're kind of seeing this opening up as more and more people are kind of crossing over into these different categories where they're not just this or not just that. And in fact, realizing that rather than existing in separate lanes, the industry really exists on a spectrum. And until all of us have what we need to do our jobs safely, sanely, and consensually, the fight isn't over. We've got to We've got to have rights for every single aspect of this industry. And we get a lot more accomplished if we work together. We collectively have a very big voice between all of the different talent that is involved, the agencies that are involved, the producers, the individual performers, even the sex toy brands themselves whose products are getting used in the different films and in these different locations. Every single one of those various folks have the ability to advocate and support the industry in a really meaningful way, especially right now where all of us collectively were affected by that Clinton era BS that excluded us all from paycheck protection programs, small business loans, etc. They pretty much gave us all the middle finger. And I think it's a beautiful thing to see everybody kind of rallying around. You know what? We need to step up. We, all of us, not just this one, this one, this one, but like we collectively have got to do something here. Yeah, it's been such an interesting thing to watch the change in the sex work culture over the last 20 year, 22 years that I've been in this industry. Because back in the day, you know, you could be a porn star and in the adult industry, that was, you know, acceptable. You were you know, performing on camera, you were an actress. Um, but if you did any escorting on the side, well, you were a dirty hooker and you were disgusting. And there were girls who would refuse to work with other girls if they thought they did escorting. I mean, it was a real divide mm -hmm. between the two kinds of sex workers and a lot of shaming going on. I bet. And, on and only recently in the last few years have I seen like a real camaraderie and coming together of people who are escorts and who are, um, porn stars and porn stars now like starting to openly admit that they do, you know, personal providership sex work on the side, you know, with individuals. Whereas before, like you would never admit that. And even, even still to this day, like I know some girls who do it, who like, will tell me like on the side, like, you know, psst, don't tell anyone. And it's just kind of like, but that, that is all changing. So mm -hmm. it's been a really interesting thing to see and it's been great. And I agree with you. Like it needs to be a collective movement. And even the word sex work is like a term that wasn't around up until a few years ago. And it's, you know, I think a great term that really encompasses everything in the sex industry and really suggests that we're all one cohesive piece. Mm, it's so interesting you mentioned that around sex work. I, I was doing a little bit of historical research into the origins and when did it become really actively used. And it correlates with the time that the red umbrella kind of came into play. This idea that all sex workers are under this like red umbrella, that we are all together, we are a collective. And you see sex work getting used along with that symbology, that kind of all encompassing, which I think is really telling as to what the essence of the word is and what we're trying to communicate when we say sex work. It's not just this or that. It's all of these things. Right. And not one should be shamed and no one's better than the other. Why do you think that this kind of cohesion has come about lately? I hate to say it. But part of the reason why we are seeing this collective consciousness sort of emerge is because attacks have come at a higher and higher rate, especially SESTA and FOSTA. SESTA and FOSTA was 
disgustingly damaging to any independent sex workers. I, I'm very fortunate and very privileged, and I have to acknowledge my privilege here that I was not using a lot of those resources since I was working out of Nevada, so I was not personally affected. However, a number of my friends absolutely were, and it just devastated their business opportunities, and it ended up forcing them into some horrifically dangerous situations that they otherwise never would have been in. I think that for the first time, we're realizing that much much in the same way as any group, we are stronger together. Whereas if we are divided, it's going to be that much easier for people to take advantage, put policies into play that are incredibly damaging. And I, I really think that SESTA and FOSTA was a hard lesson to learn. Mm, yeah, I think you're right. Let's talk a little bit about sex trafficking now, because that has become a huge topic of conversation. Oh, yes, and, it has. <laughs> um, and it is something that has clogged up my Twitter timeline excessively in the last, just the last few months. I think like quarantine has really given people opportunity to sit down and, and, and pontificate upon uh, issues that they consider to be important to them. And I, I was telling you earlier that, um, I'm excited to have Elizabeth Nolan Brown on who's written extensively about sex trafficking and a lot of the misconceptions around it. Uh, so I just wanted to hear what your opinion is on the current, like sex trafficking panic and is it warranted in all of its media hype? So right now in particular, we're seeing sex trafficking as kind of this counterance to COVID-19 being used in the media and memes by QAnon. Like there was this whole thing that a furniture company was sex trafficking kids. Way, like Wayfair, which by the way, I have bought like all my nursery furniture from Wayfair. It's great. Wild. Absolutely wild. I saw that and just had to like take a deep breath for a second here. Sex trafficking is absolutely a problem. However, sex trafficking is not what most people think it is. Sex trafficking is not happening at the legal brothels. Sex trafficking, to the best of my knowledge, I am not involved directly in the porn world, so you'd be able to speak more thoroughly on this than I can, but from my understanding, it's definitely not happening in the porn world of things. Sex trafficking is something that is completely a separate issue. It's not the same thing as sex work. Sex work is inherently consensual work where you are opting in to this, where you are literally saying, yes, I am choosing to participate in these activities with these people of my own free will. No one is coercing me, pressuring me, drugging me, manipulating me, or otherwise convincing me to do something. It's a choice. Whereas in sex trafficking, it is coercion, it is force, it is problematic. However, that is such a small, 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 very, very small subset of what is actually occurring. Globally, human trafficking is a far more problematic issue than sex trafficking. And I've come across a number of studies that have said that the hyper focus on sex trafficking, that this, this little kernel, this one thing, this shall be the thing we blow into a giant issue, isn't actually beneficial, nor is it helpful to true survivors of sex trafficking. Instead, a lot of money is getting spent on these ridiculous ad campaigns rather than actually invested in the benefit of the trafficking victims. It's, it's become another excuse for sex stigma. And that's a big problem. Mm. It's a, it's a real big problem. Yeah. Do you think that a lot of that comes from this kind of age old idea that women couldn't possibly actually enjoy being in sex work of their own accord, that women would only be doing this if they were coerced into it, if they had a drug problem that they had to support, if they had no other options in their life. And so therefore the idea of saying, well, they, you know, sex trafficking makes sense in my head to correlate that with sex work because who in their right mind, what woman in their right mind really, because it's always focused on women, not it's necessarily true. men, 
what woman in the right mind would choose this life? So they must have been trafficked into it. And so that kind of adds to this fury of the idea that this sex trafficking is this massive global issue that, that permeates the adult industry and the brothels and that kind of thing. Yes, it is super, super toxic and really, really terrible. I cannot tell you the number of times I have been asked, so, so what went wrong that you ended up in sex work? Um, I'm sorry. I think the question you meant to ask me is what am I doing right to have a successful career in which I am bringing home six figures? Let me go ahead and just rephrase that for you because you're grossly, grossly wrong. The, the idea that women can't decide for themselves, that women don't know what's in their best interest. It, it's, that's a problem. It's 2020. We should not have to have this conversation that, why, yes, women are able to consent for themselves. We actually are real human beings with brains and are able to make decisions for ourselves about our bodies. It shouldn't be and, that big of a deal. And that women can actually be inherently sexual creatures. Oh, I yes. think we, we still hold on to this idea that women are always <laughs> the, the victims or like just the receivers of sex and that they... They use it. I mean, even like women, you know, who hang on to their virginity until they get married are, are, are selling it in a way, right? I mean, they're using sex as a bargaining chip, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's something that they're using to get what they want. So the idea that, that a woman might take that and use that for a financial advantage is so like shocking and abhorrent to people, but like people who save their virginity for like the right man and the ring, like that makes sense. To people, but the men don't have to save themselves, right? Men no. should go out and they should get their kicks and they should like, you know, blow their be semen all over the state, man. be a man. Right? Oh, I hate that phrase. I hate that phrase. If I could just yeah. pick that phrase up and throw it in the dumpster, I'm freaking what I hate it. The, the whole religious morality that unfortunately does not hold true to the whole idea that we are supposed to have a separation of church and state like that hasn't happened within our government. And consequentially, I feel like a lot of people have internalized some of those religious moral beliefs, even if they don't necessarily identify as being religious. Like maybe you've come across this. I, I always ask people when they say, oh, you can't possibly enjoy yourself. I ask them, well, why can't I? Well, what's wrong with sex work? What, what's the actual problem? And a lot of the times I find that people can't actually identify where that belief came from. There's no facts to back up that belief. But we are so hardwired that the second we make a decision about something, like we decide sex work is bad, our brains already are coming up with a whole list of various reasons as to why that's got to be the right thing and we have to defend it. And we're not comfortable reconsidering our opinions and recognizing, hey, maybe that necessarily wasn't the right belief and maybe I need to change my beliefs now that I have a little bit more education. But there's that that very, very real mental component, which can be very hard for people to kind of come around from and reconcile with because they've got to examine their own sexual behavior. They've got to examine their own internalized shame and stigma about things that they may have or have not done. And I mean, it's a big, it's a big package. Like it's a lot to unpack here. And so I can understand why people are very hesitant to have an open mind as to these types of things, to be willing to listen and receive that information without instantaneous judgment. I mean, I, I do understand it, but at the same time, we live in a society where our beliefs and values are constantly challenged and are constantly being changed by the information that we have available to us. Like if you ask, well, I guess, that's not a great example. I was going to say, well, if you ask most people about mask wearing, and then I remembered, oh, wait a minute, we had mask wearing riots in this country. Let me just go yeah. ahead and- Let's let's not forget the country that we're in, Alice. Let me just <laughs> hang my head in shame here. Never mind. I'm going to retract that thought process here. Whoopsies, just kidding. Uh <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. So, we'll we'll wrap up that conversation unless you have anything else that you want to say about trafficking. Uh um, that pretty much covers the gambit yeah, of pretty it. Pretty much covered it. And that okay. consensual sex workers are very against trafficking and that there are numerous organizations that are pro sex work that also support de decriminalization movement but 
believe that it's actually going to be beneficial to preventing trafficking if we have decriminalization. So I think that's mm -hmm. kind of kind of an interesting point as far as like, well, how do you actually stop the problem? Well, that's the only instance in which the two are ever so slightly related is one of the ways you can stop trafficking is by legalizing and decriminalizing sex work, because that is what's going to genuinely drive down the demand for any sort of illicit and illegal services and make them visible enough so that when they do occur, we can stop them because it's not all happening underground on the dark web. I want to touch a little bit more on your advocacy and educational angle, because I find that to be really interesting. You have a YouTube channel, which is doing very well. And what prompted you to come up with that? And what like drives you to put yourself out there in the way that you have to teach people and change people's minds about what you do and about sex work in general? My, my YouTube channel kind of just happened organically. It started with a live video I had done on Twitter discussing consent and dating and various ways how you can get enthusiastic consent. People responded really, really positively to that and were DMing me, messaging me saying, well, we want more, we want more, we want more, we want more. So then I had done that a few more times and people were upset because they couldn't go back and rewatch the clip. And it was around that point which I realized, oh shit, I'm going to have to set up a YouTube channel and learn how to do all the YouTube things. So I decided to commit to taking all the old clips that I was able to save, dragging them over to YouTube, getting a channel set up, and I started creating more curated content. It kind of started as like a once a week coffee with Alice, like sex and morning show. And then it's evolved into all sorts of different little educational things like five common misconceptions about pet play or here's how to do fingering or here's information about polyamory you may not have known of. All those different things that people just aren't necessarily aware of. And as to my drive, I think it really just comes from this desire to enrich other people's lives through education. I think that the more we know, the more we're able to grow. Like simply being aware of something, even if it's not necessarily for you, like pet play. Not everybody's going to be into pet play, but I guarantee you that you're going to be a better person for learning a little bit about pet play. And you'll probably come to understand a couple of things either about yourself or about those that participate in that activity. That's going to widen your experience. So when you make decisions and think about sex and intimacy, it gives you a lot more to draw from than just your own limited perspective. Mm, yeah. I find that that's one of the greatest gifts that I have of having done this podcast. I mean, obviously I considered myself to be a pretty open-minded individual before I did this show, you know, because I'd worked in the porn industry for so long, but the ability to sit down and talk to so many incredible people about looking at sex and really honestly life in so many different ways, I feel like has really expanded my horizons and just made me a more compassionate understanding person overall. And it's been an incredibly enriching experience, um, in a way that I never expected. So I, I yeah, I love the educational aspect of it. It's so fantastic. Yeah. Like I feel as if every time I meet a new guest or a new person online, like I'm having to do right now with COVID and do video dates, every time I come across somebody new, I learn something. I learn something about them. I learn something about me. And I'm able to grow as a person. I, I think that the moment we stop growing, we're dead. Like, why are you even alive? If you're not willing to grow and learn and continue to work on yourself and gain new perspectives, well... What do you hope to get out of life exactly? I, I'm always very curious. It's, I think, in a kind of a strange way, not to get all philosophical here, but I, I feel like our main objective as people is to enrich the lives of those around us and to grow as a person. And everyone's growth and everyone's journey is going to look different, but you've got to go on that journey of growth. That's what life is, at least I think anyway. An enriched life is, yeah, for sure. I totally agree with you. So speaking of quarantine, um, one of my Patreon members, Coolio, asked, 
What are legal sex workers doing currently? What options do they have if they don't have the savings to wait out COVID shutdowns, especially girls without a large social following or those who are fairly new to sex work? And then in addition, how are you managing uh, the quarantine? Yes, I I do have to acknowledge, again, my privilege here of having a platform, an audience, and a presence that's online, as well as a lifestyle that allows me to have that presence online. Not all sex workers are able to be online. They may have families, secondary careers, uh, children, they're worried about impacting their lives, and so they may choose not to show their face. If you go to the branch websites, a number of ladies will have their faces blurred or hidden or turned away from the camera for that reason. So not everyone has the capacity to go online. However, that is an option for those that do. That can look like a number of different things. Primarily, it's looked like OnlyFans. Myself and a number of my coworkers have now hopped onto OnlyFans to start creating different types of content for folks. Personally, I've kind of been gearing towards more like sex education things where rather than me just describing and using a sex toy to show you how to necessarily finger a woman, well, let me go ahead and just show you how to do that, which is something mm-hmm. I can't necessarily do on YouTube. They kind of they kind of poo-poo on that sort of thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. They're not into that. <laughs> yeah, no, not so much. Um, unfortunately, government support really isn't an option. Like I'd mentioned earlier, we're disqualified from PPP and the SBA loans. But we were offered one very, very small kernel of hope. If you are a sex worker in Nevada and you did not set yourself up as an LLC or S Corp and simply were working as an independent contractor, you were able to go ahead and draw unemployment through the new CARES Act that went through, which increased and made available for the first time ever unemployment options for independent contractors. Because legal sex workers, are legal in filing their taxes. If they happen to also live in the state of Nevada, it would be covered by CARES. However, not all the brothel workers live in Nevada. Quite a number of them, the majority of them are traveling in from out of state and doing this part time. So they got nothing. They got no government support. I ended up creating a website. It's a sexworkersupport.com. Sorry, it's a sexworkersupport.com that brought together all the different funds and GoFundMes and fundraisers that have popped up across the internet and kind of homed them all in one location. So both sex workers can scroll through and see state by state by state what things that they could potentially apply for, as well as for folks that are wanting to contribute to the folks that are around them and are being affected by this. A number of different states have state-specific ones. Special interest groups have set up special interest group specific funds. I know that there's a, several trans funds that are out there as well. And then I also set up a contact form so anyone who's struggling and isn't able to find what they're eligible for can reach out to the website. And then I can start working with them in some of these nonprofits and see maybe we can find a national level organization that could help them out. Wow. You are fucking organized. <laughs> I... I got really mad. I was fueled by rage and caffeination on that project. I'll tell you. (laughs) When I found out that we were disqualified from PPP and SBA, I think I stayed up 24 hours just scouring the internet, searching for all these resources to pull them together. Like, ooh, it just made me so angry. Well, there was that case in Michigan where a bunch of strip clubs sued because of that. And I believe they won the case in the state courts, but I don't know what that means overall. But I believe, and I I could be correct, I do remember this case. I think the next step is that it has to go to a federal level. and Yeah, that's where they might... There's a lot of funding that it takes to get to the federal level. And even if they do take it to a federal level, we're looking at months and months and months and months and months before it actually arrives at the courts. By by and well, the time that they actually get, oh, okay, sure, we'll give you PPP and an SBA loan. Guess how much money is going to be left? I know. I know. And the thing is, people need it now because right now is when the government is shut down. Mm -hmm. So it's really, it's really maddening in so, so many ways. It, it really frustrates me because 
no judgment. I, I never judge how people choose to work, but I feel like I chose to go through the whole legal process. I gave up six figures of income to the government last year. I gave up 50% of my income to a legal brothel. Wh why? Why? Yeah. Why did I why did I bother? Why did I even bother yeah. to go through that whole process if they're not even going to recognize the legitimacy? Like Yeah. It's They'll like just a, bam, bam, slap to the face. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a you know, another example. I mean, the court the quarantine has exhibited so many holes in our government and our social structure. Mm. And, um, you know, sex work has always gotten the short end of the stick and never so much as now. Yes. I will so. say for those who are listening and wanting to show support for sex workers, especially those that don't have large platforms, aren't able to offer services online. I'll tell you, uh, visa gift cards, super handy can be used almost anywhere, everywhere. Ask your provider if you can email them a Visa gift card. I'm sure they would super appreciate it. Even simple things like grocery gift cards or if they have pets, like a pet store gift card. Any of those little... Amazon, Amazon too. Amazon's phenomenal because Amazon will ship yeah. right to you and they no longer are limiting what they're shipping, thankfully. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'll tell you too, like that kind of generosity will come back tenfold, hundredfold even, especially on the other side of this, uh, speaking for myself. I mean, I certainly remember those who have helped carry me through the situation. And I am so, 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 so like, I can't underestimate how grateful I am for their support. And I'm certainly going to try and pay it forward on the other side of these things too. Okay. <laughs> so cute. What are you doing? <laughs> Guest appearance. All right, Alice. Well, thank you so much. This was a really fantastic episode. So informative. You're so intelligent and engaging and eloquent. And I really, really enjoyed this conversation. So I appreciate you coming on so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's, it's just it's such a joy chatting with you. You're awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Can you tell everybody where they can uh, find you online? Yes. Uh, first place to start is going to be my website, which is thealicelittle.com. You can also find me on OnlyFans, onlyfans.com backslash thealicelittle. I am on Patreon as well for my YouTube and educational content of the more triple X rated thing isn't quite for you. And that's going to be patreon.com backslash Alice Little. And of course, people can always, always email me too. And that's going to be Alice Little at the Alice Little dot com. Can you also tell people uh, where to find your YouTube channel? Because I feel like that's a great resource. And yes. When you should not. You should not forget to plug that. I forgot about that. I do I do that too. Let me put that YouTuber hat on real quick here. I also am on YouTube. It's youtube.com backslash Alice Little TV. Fantastic. You guys should definitely check out her YouTube channel. Um, I was looking at it earlier today and yesterday, and there's so much information on there about um, sex work about companionship and it's just a plethora of information. So definitely go check it out because it's highly enjoyable. Well, thank you. You're welcome. And then you guys of course can find me at Holly Randall on Twitter and on Instagram, Holly Randall and filter.com for more about the podcast. Also sign up for our monthly newsletter and my YouTube channel, in case you're listening to this on the audio podcast platform is youtube.com slash Holly Randall unfiltered. My Patreon is patreon.com slash Holly Randall unfiltered. And if you are listening to this again on the audio platform and you want to rate my podcast to help my show get up in the charts, you can go to rate this podcast.com slash HRU and it will direct you to the proper platform where you can leave a review and rate my show. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Alice, again, thank you so much for your time. And we'll see you next week.